Their names are different, but their stories end the same way. A face on the news, a name on a headstone, and a quest for justice. Too often focused on the people who should have kept them safe. Why are mothers making deadly choices for their babies and sometimes themselves? We'll ask our guests next on Face to Face. Welcome to Face to Face. I'm John Ralston. Three-year-old Crystal Figueroa, the toddler we knew only as Baby Jane Cordova Doe, is the latest victim of deadly abuse. She, jo she joins a long list of children most of us only hear about after they suffer some horrific death. In some cases, their short lives are just as horrible. And too often, they are betrayed by the one person they should be able to count on, their mothers. Sometimes it's her, sometimes it's her husband or boyfriend. Joining us now, two domestic violence prevention advocates. From Safe Nest, a Las Vegas-based shelter which provides counseling, education, and advocacy, Kathleen Brooks. And from Safe House, which provides the same services, just in Henderson, Andrea Sundberg. Welcome back to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we were just talking, you're always on this program under these horrific circumstances that we have to talk about. But I'm just wondering from each of you, let's start talking about this this way. Uh, when you first heard about this case and the details of this case, you probably thought about people who had come into your shelter. You, uh, t tell me what went through your mind. Well, the first thing I think about is the picture I saw of the mother, that she had a black eye. So I have to wonder. Um, if she was really battered by this person and experienced uh, Stockholm Syndrome and felt unable to escape from him and felt powerless to protect her child. That's not letting her off the hook, but those are some of the things I thought about. Although some people will say that, you know, and you, you probably hear this a, lo a lot, uh, you know, these women are not always victims, uh, but, but you see that she clearly was abused, mm -hmm. uh, but what is her culpability? That's what a, qu a lot of question. Mm -hmm. You probably ask yourself that about women in your shelter all the time, no? Yes, I do, and, and the thing is that I believe she will live with the guilt and shame and horror of what happened to her child way more than he ever will. Mm -hmm. You know, her loss is gonna be significant different from his um, and she's gonna pay the consequences for it. What went through your mind? Did you, did you, when you see something like this, mm -hmm. uh, do you relate it to something that with some of the women that, 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 that have come through your shelter? What do you think about when you see Absolutely. it? Absolutely. When the story first broke, the first thing I thought of was I have no doubt in my mind this is somehow related to domestic violence. The other thing I thought of is, you know, especially once the story broke, the one thing we're hearing about is the mother's culpability, the mother's culpability. What about his? I mean, the reality is that we don't know who actually killed this little girl. I'm placing bets that it was him. Mm -hmm. And where's the father? I mean, last we heard the father was in jail in LA. You know, what kind of support, what services was he providing for the mother? We in our society tend to put more blame on the mothers of the, that when this happens, but overwhelmingly we're finding that it's not the mothers that have committed the murder, it is the abuser. So where, why aren't we placing the blame on them and saying, what's wrong with them? Where are the services for them? And why aren't they getting help? But well, why, I guess what people are going to be saying if they're watching this perhaps mm -hmm. to play devil's advocate, or why do people who run shelters like this uh, always see the women purely as victims? You know, this, this is this girl's mother. Mm -hmm. And if this guy was hitting her, abusing her, doing these kinds of things, why didn't she protect her child? People are going to be asking, right? Well, they be? It's, it's like terrorism in the home. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really difficult for people to understand if this is a very very violent person and he is battering the woman within an inch of her life and battering the children and she doesn't have resources and she doesn't know how to get away from him and he says if you leave me I will kill you I will kill the kids and it does happen mm -hmm. so that kind of stress and oppression will keep her in the relationship she'll feel very trapped and not know how to get out and not know how to protect herself but also I want to clarify that, I mean, both are, my, for my agency and I believe for Safe Nest too, correct me if I'm wrong, we're not letting her off the hook. If you have a child in your home, you are a parent, you are responsible for the care and protection of that child. So ultimately, yes, they need to be, there needs to be some accountability, but we want equal accountability. We're tired of hearing it's all the mother's fault when, you know, where's the other person's responsibility in this? Where are the fathers in this picture? They could just walk away and it's all this mother's responsibility to raise this child. This woman had no money. She had to call her mother to get back to California. 
So if you're in Oregon, you're in Minnesota, you don't have access to money, how are you going to get back to someplace safe when you don't have that money to get back? When we come back, let's talk about some of the specific uh, facts of this case, see if you can relate it to what generally does happen in these cases. And we're going to ask a, a question I want you ladies to try to answer. Why didn't she take her own child who was hurting and maybe near death to the hospital? We'll talk about that when we return. Face to Face with John Ralston. Welcome back to the program. We're talking about domestic violence and child abuse, and we're using the case of poor little Crystal Figueroa. That's who baby Jane turned out to be with a couple of experts we've had on the program before from a couple of shelters uh, that look after women here in the community. All right, let's take a look at the arrest warrant. I'm going to take a look at some of the facts in this case. And first of all, why Crystal's mother did not seek help. They located a hospital but did not go in fearing that both Gladys's, that's the mother, visible injuries and those visible on Crystal would result in issues with hospital staff. <clears throat> Anthony was concerned for the same reason, the fact that he was on parole, that this is the boyfriend. Gladys said her and Anthony panicked and drove around for a while. She said that Anthony decided to place Crystal's body into a dumpster and then call 911. He drove the car into an apartment complex that she could not recall the name of and stopped by a dumpster. Anthony retrieved the box from the dumpster and placed Crystal's body wrapped in a blue blanket into a box. Anthony put the box in the dumpster and they drove away, never mm -hmm. calling 911. And then look later in the statement, uh, the, the, there's, uh, she almost seems to contradict herself. Listen to this. Crystal got sick and began vomiting. They all fell asleep and when they woke up, Crystal was still vomiting. They were driving to the hospital when Crystal's body began to seize. She stopped breathing and died. Gladys said she was so upset she lost consciousness for approximately one hour. When she awoke, Crystal's body was missing from the car. Gladys asked Anthony where Crystal was, and Anthony told her he placed Crystal in a box and put her in a dumpster behind an apartment complex in Las Vegas. Did she witness him doing this or not? It's hard to tell because she kind of contradicts mm -hmm. herself. Is, 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 you know, she does, but she did not protect her kid enough to get taken to the hospital. Right, and it says in the report he was concerned, or they were concerned, about her bruises. The hospital would not have reported necessarily her abuse, but they would have reported mm -hmm. the child abuse. Yeah, and, and, but even, even that does not get to the main point, or she's this kid's mother, and he's saying, oh no, you're, I'm going to get in trouble for domestic violence. Well, who cares? This kid is dying. Doesn't mm -hmm. the mother have an obligation she, to do something? Yes, she does, and if she were to come into our shelters, we would report the abuse. We would do mm -hmm. that. We would try to get mom to do it first, and then we would report it. She does have an obligation, but the issue here is power and control. Mm -hmm. Could she make him go to the hospital. He was driving. Was he beating her when he was driving? Did she have any control over the situation? I, I know you want to no. jump in here, but, but I also want you to get to the point, and this is, this is the really difficult question mm -hmm. here, is where is the line of responsibility in cases like this? Because everyone is different. The amount of abuse is different. The, the, the kinds mm -hmm. of abuse, physical and psychological. Where do you draw that line? You draw that line when your child is start being, is it being injured, you know, you have to take some steps to protect that child. Now, if let's look at her statement if in fact she had passed out and she told the police okay we put her in a box we put her in the dumpster if she was passed out and he told her that it would make sense to me that she would tell the police this is what happened and then later on say well I didn't actually see him do this this is what he told me mm -hmm. so you know yes there sh she should have gone to the hospital we want victims to know that if you go to the hospital they're not going to automatically report the abuse unless it's a gunshot wound a knife wound third degree burns or more those are the only times that they have to report it they would have had to report the child abuse against the child but not necessarily against her but again Kathleen is absolutely right it's the issue of the power and control. He had the control in the situation. He had the money. Obviously, he was abusing her. He so was driving. He was driving. He made the decisions. But you know, let, let me. I know you want to say something, but let me just read a couple of statistics here. Uh, six times more likely a kid is to die if the mom is abused. That's mm -hmm. what some of the studies yes. show. Sixty percent of the cases of child abuse, there, there, there is domestic violence. Yes. I, I mean, there is a clear nexus here. There mm -hmm. definitely is, and, uh, and if you think back, there's a case back east where a doctor beat his wife almost to death, 
and killed their child. Mm -hmm. And that woman came and spoke in Las Vegas and her whole face was scarred still from the abuse that she experienced. There was no way she could reach out and protect that child. Um, is she accountable? Yeah, it's her child and there has to be a way for her to, to be able to deal with that. But what if she is totally trapped and can't do anything about and it? Sometimes that's difficult to discern, and the psyche mm -hmm. of every person is different too. Well, let's look. At, let's take, put this in context, though. But what's going on here in Clare County? And we've talked about this before on mm -hmm. this program. Last year, there were 239 criminal child abuse cases filed, up from 82 filed in 2003. And, and let me show you something. Someone you probably know had to say about this. Susan Roski is with the mm -hmm. county public defender's office. She's frustrated with the rise in these cases. What is it going? to take to make people understand how important these services are? Is it that as a community we don't feel we have an obligation to pay for the services for those who are in trouble and can't afford them? You think she's right about that? I yes, do. I do. I definitely think she's right. It, domestic violence, child abuse aren't issues that we want to put money in because there's no way to make money from it. There's no, you know, a lot of times you don't see the outcomes, and that's what it's all gone, gone to. It's that's an incredibly you, cynical view, though. I it mean, is a cynical view. Don't you view. think there are people in this state in elective office who care mm -hmm. about these issues and want to put more money into them? There are, but, but they don't do it. It's not mm -hmm. happening. We're losing money. Mm -hmm. And yes, there is a, a correlation between domestic violence and child abuse. And we do see perpetrators raised in violent homes growing up and being perpetrators. And um, we need to be able to hold them accountable. But, and the key is prevention. We need to do more prevention and more education. And we as a community need to come together. Mm -hmm. Our shelter programs, our advocacy programs, our counseling programs are basically free services. Mm -hmm. The real, real problem too is that, and I read this statistic, this is a national statistic, 50 to 60% of the cases are probably going unreported. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of domestic violence and child abuse. Absolutely. Exactly. And you probably find that too in, 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 in what you, what do you do about that? We need to encourage our community to get involved. You, if you hear something going on in your neighbor's house, if you don't want to call the police, talk to that person. Give them a hotline number for Safe House or Safe Nest and say, look, I don't know if you need help, but here. I do that all the time. I get in trouble and b get told to do wonderful things to myself because I give people my business cards when I see bruises on them and say, look, I don't know if you need help, but if you do, here's a place that can help and you. And here's the thing I think that people need to realize, we've got to take a break, but that you might see a woman with a black eye. People might say, you know, she can take care of herself. Mm -hmm. What about the children in that mm -hmm. house? Yeah. They, they might mm -hmm. not be able to. When we come back, we're going to talk, though, about when moms should be held accountable and are there factors here in Las Vegas that can be traced that cause more domestic abuse and child abuse. to face I'm John Ralston we're talking about poor little Crystal Figueroa that was the little girl tossed in the dumpster her parents are now in jail her mother and her boyfriend are now in jail charged with murder we're talking to a couple of experts on domestic violence and what how that can lead to child abuse today on the program a couple aspects here I want to talk about first of all there's a lot of if you read about this uh, the guy was a gambler and mm -hmm. often took out uh, his gambling losses on the woman and probably the child. This would seem to me a fairly common pattern in Las Vegas. It's not connected. There's not a correlation no. between gambling and domestic violence. Mm -hmm. This man had a history of being violent. Um, and so, you know, he would be violent whether he lost money or won money um, or was drinking or not drinking. Mm -hmm. So we can't say that because there's gambling and, and it's 24 hours here in Las Vegas that, that we have more domestic violence or that causes it. What about the link between, uh, this was a this is a, a, a woman who was pregnant as a teenager. She, mm -hmm. she, she had her first kid, I believe, at 17. Do you see a pattern with, with, with teenage pregnancies leading to domestic violence mm -hmm. and child abuse? Yeah, a person who has a child as a teenager is at increased risk of domestic violence. I think the last study I, shot, I saw was that they were like 60% more likely to be victims of abuse. Because, and we do see a lot of uh, teen pregnancies here where the, the father of the child is over age. So they're over the age of 18. Um, many times, probably in their 30s, I've seen where the 
the child is 16, 17, 15, 14. And we do see a really high correlation between the teen pregnancy and the And the bad is violence. always high in the national mm -hmm. list for teen yes. pregnancies, yes, which of course are. shows some of the problems here. But again, as you, as you tried to point out, it might not be endemic to Las Vegas. There mm -hmm. are a lot of different it's factors. Not. But the meth problem here, which is a problem all over the mm -hmm. place, uh, Susan Klein Rothschild, who's the director of the Clark County Family Services, told the Sun that she wants to see more of money invested in substance abuse treatment, low-income housing, mental health, and domestic violence programs. Let me show you what she had to say. If people don't have a way to meet their basic needs, taking care of their children is compromised. If we don't agree to pay for the help these people need now, we'll be paying for them eventually by way of the criminal justice system, which of course is common sense, and mm -hmm. you would think mm -hmm. that people would understand this who are making the laws, who are funding the programs, mm -hmm. but consistently they don't, do they? No, they don't. They just refuse to see that connection and that it, it's a systemic problem. Mm -hmm. And we have to start with the children. We have to go to, into the schools and educate the teens because of teen dating violence. Mm -hmm. We need to work with the moms. We know, need to hold perpetrators accountable. And as you know, I have an issue with the courts not doing what they're supposed to do mm -hmm. and holding them accountable. You need to arrest that person, put them in jail, um, make them go to perpetrator's treatment, and re-arrest if they re-offend. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a lot of stories, of course, about the rise of housing costs mm -hmm. in, in, in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. How many women come to your shelters and just can't afford to leave because there's nowhere else, but they can't afford an apartment, they can't yeah, afford anywhere else to Does that happen a lot? Most of them. Oh, absolutely. We, we see that happen consistently. That how do you get, we at Safe House had transitional housing. We had two transitional houses available. Those are no longer available because the people that own them sold them because they made so much money off of them. So how do you get affordable housing when you move here, you may have a high school diploma, you get a job earning $10 an hour, that's $400 a week, $1,600 a month. Find an apartment on that and survive and support two kids. We need more resources for victims of domestic violence, for all of women actually. Child care is another huge oh, issue, affordable huge. child care. A lot of our clients are left with the choice. Do I leave my child with this guy that I know is abusing me and I don't know what he's going to do to the kids or do I lose my job? Or sometimes he will batter her so mm -hmm. that if she got the job, she can't go to work because she has bruises. Mm -hmm. um, we have two shelters and we tend to keep people longer because there's no place to house them. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to just dump them in the streets. So if they're working their case um, um, the way that they need to, then we try to move them into uh, whatever transitional housing we have, and we kind of use our second shelter for that. Well, it's interesting that you say you're losing some of this transitional housing because people want to make money uh, mm -hmm. off of these houses, yeah. which, which is terrible. I mean, it, yeah, but I mean, I mean, there has to be more charity, both in the private sector and there has to be the public sector mm -hmm. contributing by making this a priority. What do you think? Is, is 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 the county now making this more of a priority? Do you get that sense or not? No, I don't no. get that you sense. Don't. I what we were talking about earlier is we're seeing a pulling away of resources, mm -hmm. both on the national level from from the federal government and locally. Why? Um, As the problem gets worse they're pulling resources away? There's a lot of backlash against domestic violence. There's still that myth about we break up family systems, mm -hmm. we don't really help them, shelters don't are just a band-aid. Um, there's no real addressing of the problem in terms of education and prevention and people really getting involved. Mm -hmm. They just kind of want, they just turn their heads. You're experiencing the same thing? Absolutely, we're experiencing exactly the same thing. Uh, the recent, the funding for Violence Against Women Act, it took five months for that to get approved. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be signed in the end of September. It was just signed last month. The proposed budget for 2007 federally is completely eliminating Victim of Crime Act funding, which help fun helps fund many domestic violence programs, counseling services for victims. We are seeing more funds being pulled away. Part of it is, yeah, they're saying it's a deficit problem, that the funding has to go to other places. But you know what? What's more important than keeping our clients, be keeping people safe in this country? Yeah, our let's families let's safe. We, let, we, let, we have to let that be the last word, ladies. You, you guys do the Lord's work. I, I I really appreciate <laughs> uh, your, your being here. Let's be clear on one thing, too, about this case. If not for some luck and from some great police work, we never, might never Absolutely. have known that. Absolutely. Think Absolutely. about, again, I say this with Adicelli Snyder and with all the other cases. Think how many other cases are going on mm -hmm. that we don't know and about. And victims exactly. need to get help. Victims need to get help. Thanks yeah. for coming on the program. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. When we come back on Face to Face, we're going to read some of your feedback on the air.
watching Face to Face with John Ralston. Welcome back to the program. Now we're going to read some of your feedback. Let's take a look at some of the reactions to recent episodes. A viewer and school district teacher weighed in on our program on later school start time. Here's what Ken had to say. It doesn't make any difference when the school start time is, when the kids are going to stay up later because school will be starting later. They're still going to be in first and second period in high school. They're still going to be sleeping, snoring zombies. It really doesn't make a difference when school starts. The kids are still going to take advantage of the thing. And I think he's right. High schoolers are high schoolers. A viewer named Theo took issue with something Senator Harry Reid said on our program about Vice President Dick Cheney's hunting accident. Harry Reid was talking about Cheney taking 24 hours to give any news on the shooting of his friend. I wonder if Harry forgot back in August when he had his transient ischemic attack. Nobody in the country knew about that for three days until he had had that. This is what I love about partisan spin. The Republicans are equating a guy who has a mini stroke with a guy who actually could have committed a crime by shooting somebody. I don't think it's a good analogy. A few viewers reacted to our program on military recruiting tactics. Paul says, war is not nice, or in more familiar terms, war is hell. However, if we are to enjoy our freedom, there is a price, and that price is more than money. Lives are lost, but a young civilian, referring to Joe Sacco, who was on from Project Counter Recruitment, he clearly doesn't get the message. Maybe he could try living permanently halfway around the world, where people have a different system. Theirs doesn't work real well. An anonymous viewer also disputed claims on our show by the Army captain who defended the military's recruiting tactics. They, referring to military recruiters, do lie to the children. Yes, I did serve my country. They tell them that so they can go on the buddy system and stay together. They do contact children who don't know they are even on the list. The captain on your show today is lying. Well, I don't know if he was lying, but everyone has a story to tell about this, and it's clear a lot of people are upset about how the military is recruiting kids out of school. Howard, meanwhile, had some harsh words for me after my interview with Sheriff Bill Young, who thinks gangster rap music inspires violence. I think you are such a scumbag for defending the gangster rappers. How many more people have to die because of these scummy SOBs before people like you realize what they are really all about? And of course, for those people who watch the pro program, I was doing a little something I do called being devil's advocate. If you want to contact me, you can email me at Ralston at Vegas.com or you can call me 650-1976. You can also click on the face-to-face -face link at LasVegasSun.com for the latest schedule updates or on the link at klastv.com to catch the program and streaming video on the web. And now you can stay up to the minute with links to my TV program, my columns, and my email newsletter by clicking on ralstonflash.com. On the next Face to Face, more of the issues that matter to you from people in the know, only on Las Vegas One.